Hello, everyone, and thank you for joining us for today's live webinar. We still have a few attendees rolling in here, so let's give them a second. All right, we'll get started here. My name is Michelle Allison, and I'm the publisher of Potatoes in Canada. I'm joined today by Dr. Robert Vernon, entomologist and IPM consultant with Sentinel IPM Services, and Anne McRae, technical service specialist with BASF. Today, during our session, Bob and Anne will discuss wireworm challenges and management strategies across Canada. A special thanks to BASF for sponsoring our session today. BASF has a diverse portfolio of fungicides, herbicides, and insecticides to help you manage key potato pests all season long and maximize the yield and quality of your crop. This webinar is being recorded and will be made available to all attendees and registrants approximately 24 hours after our live broadcast. This session is scheduled to run for approximately 45 to 60 minutes, and after both presenters have um, shared their slides, we'll open up the floor for questions. If you have any questions throughout the presentation, please type them into the questions tab of the two webinar panel on your computer screen. The webinar has been approved for one CCA CEU credit in IPM, and further instruction for submissions will follow the presentation. Our first presenter is Dr. Robert Vernon, who is an entomologist born and raised in British Columbia, Canada, who worked as a cereal and vegetable IPM specialist for Agriculture and Agri-Food Canada from 1980 to 2017. During that time, he spent at least 25 years working on wireworm biology and management in Canada and the USA, which he continues to do so post-retirement as a private consultant. Bob received a master's degree in pest management and PhD from Simon Fraser University, both in 1979, and has authored or co-authored 60 plus scientific papers and additional book chapters on wireworms. He has a diverse portfolio on development of IPM tools for wireworm management, which has helped bring this pest complex under control in many areas of Canada. Without further ado, I'll let you take it away, Robert. Well, thank you very much. Um, I really appreciate the opportunity to speak to you. Uh, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna get right into my talk and I'm gonna get rid of my face here, uh, which takes up space. So we'll see you later and I'll get right into my talk. So, um, talk, which we will get to uh, in half of the talk, but. First of all, we have to get this going here, um, do a little bit of wireworm biology uh, to set the stage. So we're not dealing with Colorado potato beetles, which are one species. We're dealing with several uh, wireworm species. Uh, there's probably more than 20 economic species occurring across Canada. And uh, this is a bit of an ugly rogues gallery of uh, different species that uh, uh, can cause damage to cereals or potatoes in uh, uh, crops across Canada and North America. Uh, wireworms are not worms, they're insects. Uh, they're the larval stage of click beetles, uh, two of which are shown here. These are very serious pests uh, that I'm showing. And uh, because we have such a diversity of uh, wireworm problems, uh, in North America, it was very important for us to conduct a uh, in-depth survey right across Canada to find out what species we have in different agricultural areas. So the first thing you have to do if you're going to uh, come up with uh, a uh, IPM pro program or controls for a pest is to know uh, where they are and who they are. So uh, from 2004 on, uh, we've been getting samples sent to us from all over Canada. And uh, my colleague here, Dr. Wim Van Herrick, who's taken my place in Canada, uh, is the one who did all of the identifications over the last uh, almost 20 years now. What we have found is that um, going from west to east in BC, we have certain wireworm pests that stand out, shown here. You get into the prairies, we have a number of different pests. 
we get into Ontario, we have different pests again, different species in Quebec and different species in Atlantic Canada. So uh, we don't have the same species in all areas. So <clears throat> we also have some exotic species that have come in from Europe uh, over the past hundred years, three of which are shown here in Atlantic Canada. And we have two of those in British Columbia. These are causing enormous problems. Now in BC, these are the two biggest problems. And uh, we just, we've just completed another survey, which uh, things um, started getting bad in uh, the Vancouver area and about 50 years ago, and they have now spread just about uh, throughout British Columbia. Uh, this is the key pest uh, that's causing most of the damage in the prairies. And this particular exotic species is causing enormous problems in Prince Edward Island. Now, why is this all important? Well, because we're finding, or we have found, that uh, different insecticides will uh, give different levels of control with different species. And so with neonix, for example, we get very good control in potatoes, for example, uh, on these species with certain neonix. Uh, they work very well on Limonius californicus and uh, cereal crops in the prairies. But in uh, Prince Edward Island, they don't seem to do a very good job on potatoes there. So uh, just give you an example of uh, why it's important to know what species you have. Life cycle. Let's begin with the adult stage. The adult stage typically emerges from the soil where they've spent the winter, uh, usually March, April, May, and uh, they mate and start to lay eggs in the soil. Uh, those eggs hatch in about three weeks into what we term neonate wireworms or new wireworms. Okay, that's an important term. So uh, after the first year, they're about a quarter of an inch long, and then they stay in the soil and they become residents there for the rest of their life cycle. And uh, depending on the species, that life cycle can last from three to five years where you have wireworms in the soil. In the final year, of their life history, they pupate, usually in August. And after about three weeks of pupation, they become adults. So the adult stage stays in the ground, typically, for most species. And then the following spring, they come out and start the whole cycle again. What's really challenging about wireworms is that everything happens underground, pretty much. And uh, it's a very uh, difficult insect. Uh, to work on. When I say insect, I mean there's lots of different species that we have to consider, and the details vary between those species. So, how do they become a problem? Well, um, wireworm populations build up in grassy areas, uh, such as grassy ditches, uh, undisturbed field borders, dikes, uh, pasture lawns, grassy road edges, and so on. Wherever you have permanent grass, you're gonna have wireworm populations building up in them of many different species. And so every year, you're gonna have a cohort of the species in those grassy areas forming adults. Those adults then uh, mate, lay eggs. But at some point in their life history, later on, they feel compelled to move into other areas to lay eggs to expand their range. So they're moved by walking or flying into adjacent fields. Now, if those adjacent fields are in, for example, cereal crops or in grasses, they love that uh, sort of habitat to lay eggs. And so they'll move in there. And that's where you get problems happening. So you've got a field here of uh, barley. Um, the click beetles will enter the, those uh, grassy fields or cereal crops and usually April, May, and June, typically no edge effects. They just kind of wander around, lay eggs in that uh, developing crop. And uh, then you end up with neonate larvae, which, and you can have more than one species, which live and feed for years in the soil. And populations in the soil will increase with the number of years that that field is under grass or cereal crops. 
So in this particular hypothetical rotation, uh, they'll come in and lay eggs in the wheat and the barley rotations, uh, and then you have potatoes, and then the following year is wheat, they'll come in and, and lay eggs again there. So you can have enormous buildups. Now, before 2004 in Canada, uh, growers used lindane on their cereal, cereal crop, and um, that uh, lindane treatment killed most neonates and most resident wireworms in the field, which I'll be discussing later. But, um, and so there they go, they disappear. And so you don't have a problem. But when Lindane left us uh, and we replaced them with Neonix, over the last uh, 15 years, uh, we've had the opposite effect of Lindane. Populations are exploding. And that's because Neonix don't actually kill them on uh, uh, cereal crop seed, which I'll discuss in a minute. So what you have, is the population is exploding in those fields. And when you go to plant another cereal crop in that field, you can have wrecks uh, such as shown here uh, with Lemonius californicus in uh, Southern Alberta, for example. It's also happening in the Pacific Northwest of the US. So this is a problem when you rotate, say grass or cereal crops with something like potatoes. And so if you have a buildup of wireworms in your cereal crop uh, rotation, then you put potatoes in that field, they'll feed on the potatoes and cause this sort of damage. So the rest of the talk is going to be concerned with uh, controlling them on cereal crops, controlling wireworms, so that we end up uh, with this. So if you can get rid of wireworms in your cereal crop rotations, then you're going to have less of a problem in your potato or sugar beet rotations, for example. And we're also gonna talk about how you can control wireworms um, in your potato crop rotation. So that'll be in two parts coming up. So let's get into control. Uh, we'll start with wireworm control in wheat. Uh, we've been doing a lot of um, uh, studies in wheat for the last 25 years. Basically, if you plant a wheat seed in the field <clears throat> and you don't have an insecticide treatment on that wheat seed, this is what happens. Uh, wheat, when it germinates, produces carbon dioxide. And wireworms of darn near every species respond to carbon dioxide. And they move in to where the carbon dioxide source is and they feed on the crops or the germinating seed as shown here. So you can have a big wireworm that basically consumes two or more seeds uh, during their hunger phase, which is in the spring. Okay, so that's a problem. Question is, can we control wireworm damage with seed treatments? And can wireworms actually be killed with seed treatments? And that's where focus is gonna be uh, here on in. In the past, we had lindane. I mentioned that. Uh, former silver bullet. It provided good stand protection in the cereals, it, but it also killed wireworms quite effectively. But it's gone. It was uh, banned uh, due to environmental issues and good riddance. But that was the end of the silver bullet. But this is how it worked. And this is how we want our future uh, seed treatments to work. Uh, when you put lindane on wheat seed, this is what happens. It produces carbon dioxide just like normal. The wireworms move in, they feed, and a lot of them die. Not everybody, but uh, they feed and die within a month or so. And um, lindane will take out 65 to 70 percent of the resident population during the growing season. Now, while they're dead or dying, the crop grows, and then in late spring and early summer, you have click beetles coming in, which lay eggs in the wheat and form neonates. Now, we also found that lindane kills neonate wireworms, and we have a greater than 85% reduction of neonates in this, on this one species, Aggregators obscurus, over seven field studies. So it's quite residual, but lindane's now gone. So what do we have that might replace it? Well, we've looked at neonicotinoids, such as Cruiser Max, 
over the years. Um, we've looked at diamides such as Fortenza, which is Siazapir. We've looked at uh, phenylpyrazoles such as uh, Regent and um, or Fipronil. And we've looked at virtually all of the insecticide classes uh, that are out there. Uh, these are three that I'm going to focus on today. And what have we discovered? Well, with neonicotinoids like Cruiser, you put that on the seed, plant the seed, produces carbon dioxide, the wireworms move in, but instead of dying, they just go to sleep. They're intoxicated, they're moribund, they writhe around, and they can do that for literally months. Okay, and while they're doing that, the crop grows. And then later on, uh, most of the wireworms recover by midsummer, and then they can feed on the roots and so on, but it doesn't really reduce yield at that point. So later on, you get the wireworms coming into the established wheat crop, laying eggs. Uh, they turn into neonates or hatch into neonates, but we get zero kill of neonates with neonicotinoids. They do not kill a single wire, uh, neonate wireworm. So the result is you get great crop establishment and yield, but very little reduction in resident wireworms and no reduction of neonates. Wireworms are there the next year, and this is true for all neonics and all of the species that we've tested. Okay, so that's neonics at 30 grams active ingredient per 100 kilograms of seed. That's the maximum rate in, in Canada. What about diamides? such as for Tenzin. Basically, we get very similar response to diamides as we do with neonics. Uh, the wireworms are immobilized while the crop grows. The wireworms recover. Uh, we get a very low kill of residents and no kill of neonates. Wireworms are there the next year. And so basically, they function very similar to the neonics. What about fipronil? And the reason, well, it'll become obvious why I'm talking about fipronil here. At the low rate of five grams active per 100 kilogram seed, this is what you get with fipronil. Uh, you get very high kill of resident wireworms. You get greater than 90% reduction of, of residents, which is even better than Lindane was. Uh, when you get the neonates being formed, it wipes them out too. It kills greater than 92% of neonates in our field studies, which is even better than Linde. So to recap, we have the neonics, which give reversible intoxication and poor kill, but usually good wheat stand protection, unless you have really high populations in a field, and then even the neonics won't. Uh, won't hold them. You can, you can still get wrecks, which we've seen in Alberta. With diamides, basically the same thing as the neonics. But with fipronil, we found that it kills all species that we've tested at very low rates. We get very good wheat stand protection, even better than Linde. Silver so bullet material, we thought so at the time. And I've been working on Fipronil uh, now for 25 years and I've been excited <laughs> about it for years. But the bad news is that it will not be registered on cereal or potato crops in Canada. Uh, it is registered for wireworm control on potatoes in the US, um, but not in Canada. So is there good news for us, for Canada? Well, not for wireworms, there isn't. And this is why. In 2012, BASF came to our lab uh, at, uh, in Agassiz uh, when I was with the federal government, and uh, they had a new chemical that they wanted to try out for wireworms, and it later became known as Taraxa. So we put it in uh, this one trial in, uh, at UBC, and uh, the species was Agriotus lineatus, another one of the European species. And we tested it in a second uh, field at UBC. The populations were enormous in those fields. It was a really good test. Uh, this is the untreated check plot, which is virtually wiped out. 
And this is what eventually became Tarak. So we got really excited when we saw how lush and vibrant the, uh, the, the growth was. And that was at 25 grams active per 100 kilogram seed, which is about the same as a neonic treatment or uh, diamide treatment like Portenza. So <clears throat> these are the results. This is the first study. And this is um, um, counts done over three weeks. This is the final count, which is the most important. And basically, we get very similar results uh, with Taraxa to the other top candidate. Uh, in the second study, same sort of thing. Okay, significant uh, uh, stand protection over the controls. And that became Taraxa. What we do in all of our trials is uh, we then come back the following year and we put bait traps in those plots to see if the wireworm populations have in fact been controlled or killed. And so this is what we found. Came back the next year and we found 85% kill of the resident populations with Taraxa in the first study. In the second study, 86% kill relative to the check. And that's Taraxa. So we were very, very excited about this because it seemed to um, perform as well as Lindane, but at uh, the 25 gram rate. So then we started doing uh, routine field studies in 2013 on this different species. And this is what we found in terms of uh, stand protection with Taraxa. We also tested. Um, one gram, 2.5, five and, and 10 gram rates. This is what we found. Basically significant uh, stand protection, as good as Lindane, as good as Gripernel at five grams, and as good as Cruiser. And that's uh, tracks at the five gram rate. So we're just gonna focus on the five gram rate from now on. Following year, we came back and looked at uh, mortality. This is uh, tracks at the five gram rate, which is uh, significant in terms of its kill relative to some other insecticides, such as Cruiser here. So we had 80% kill, and we had 83% kill in Fipronil at the same rate. Very exciting stuff. This is thiamethoxam or Cruiser. Uh, at the uh, 30 gram rate relative to the control here. Numbers were even higher. So do low numbers of wireworms in the bait traps prove that we're getting mortality? What we do in our field studies is we bring, or we use the same seed that we used in the field and put them in buckets in the lab. We put 10 seeds per bucket for each treatment. And in the bucket, we put five large hungry wireworms, and which basically gives us a lab duplicate of the field studies. So we look at stand protection over 14 days. We look to see if the wireworms are distressed in some way. Uh, with neonics, uh, they will often writhe to the surface and uh, then recover and move back down into the soil. So we keep our eye on this sort of thing. At the end of the 14 days, we dump out the buckets and we retrieve all of the five wireworms per bucket that are still alive. And we give them health tests for the next um, 200 days. So every week, we take the wireworms out of each of their vials and we give them a health test. And that tells us exactly what's happening over time with them underground. So this is nine treatments uh, in nine buckets, of course, in the bucket studies. This is uh, the untreated. So all of the wireworms are healthy when you first take them out of the buckets. This is Taraxa at five grams. And what Taraxa has, uh, as well as Fipronil, that other insecticides don't have, is this symptom that's in red. Once wireworms have that symptom, basically they're convulsing uh, or they're contracted then they will die. They do not recover. 
So you can see we have a lot of that in this, at that five gram rate. And we have none of it in the um, cruiser. Okay. In the cruiser, we have a lot of writhing going on and sleeping, but none of this lethal uh, symptom. 50 days later, you can start to see that uh, we're starting to get some black. That, that is death from the insecticide. And so we're starting to uh, see a little bit of death in, in the control as well as in the uh, cruiser. Cruiser, you can see that they're starting to uh, recover, but not in Troxa. 78 days, we're getting more and more death in the uh, Troxa treatments. And at 188 days, everybody's dead in the Troxa treatment. So this is Taraxa, uh, Cruiser, a lot of uh, recovery. Cruiser and the control are about the same. We also look to see if the insecticides are repellent. And so we'll put wire worms uh, in these soil windows. We put uh, the treated wheat seed in here. The wheat seed produces carbon dioxide. The wire worms will move in. If they don't like it, they'll be repelled. Uh, that doesn't happen with Taraxa. So tracks at all rates is not repulsive. They will go in, they will feed, and they will die, which is good to know. So this is a summary of seven years of field data um, of our wheat trials. So we'll start off with percent stand over the seven years. This is the average of that seven years. And you can see that there's very little difference between Taraxa in the black and Cruiser in the gray. Now, if you look at percent wireworm survival in the Taraxa, here we are, 80% kill average over seven years relative to cruiser. There's only a 6% kill, which is not significantly different than the control. So what with cruiser and Taraxa differ is, is here in terms of mortality. In terms of diamides, uh, such as Fortenza, this is a trial done in 2019. Uh, these are the stand counts uh, over two weeks, June 14th, June 20th. Uh, we'll focus on the June 20th counts. So this is Taraxa relative to Cruiser, both the same, no significant difference. With Fortenza, you do get a significant drop in stand relative to, say, Cruiser, but not to uh, Taraxa. Um, and Taraxa, of course, is significantly better than the Czech, as it is everything else. Now, the following uh, year, when we take, or when we look at our bait traps, the following year to see, to look at mortality with Taraxa, we get a 92% kill. Bruiser, 9% kill, Fortenza, 19% kill. So Traxa is clearly uh, more toxic than uh, these other insecticides. So Traxa at five grams, I'm gonna show you is very, very similar to Fipronil. Uh, rapidly kills residents. There's no feeding during that time. We get between 80 and 90% plus reduction in residents, which is better than Lindane was. When you get crop establishment and neonates being formed, Taraxa kills between 80 and 90% of neonates in our field trials, which is as good as Lindane. Very similar to, uh, to Fipronil. Silver bullet? Well, we'll talk about that later. But I want to switch over and talk about wireworm control in potatoes right now and the work that we've been doing similar to the work in cereal crops. In our potato trials, we locate a field of pasture uh, that we know is loaded with wireworms. And uh, we uh, get rid of the organic matter in that field, prepare it for planting, plant our crops. At 100 and 120 days after planting, we do harvest, so we do two harvests. And uh, um, when we harvest our potatoes, we clean them. 
And uh, we have always used uh, Chieftain variety for consistency. And we have always used this, uh, this lady to do the grading over at least 15 years. So she's an expert at it and her grading is consistent. And we're very confident in the results we get with her. These are what our plots look like, treated rows of each treatment, replicated at least four times. And those treatment rows are flanked by guard rows, which are untreated. At harvest, we harvest the center row on two occasions. Okay, so half is done uh, at 100 days and the other half at 120 days. Uh, we have uh, professional um, minor use program people do our treatments, um, especially our uh, spray over treatments. And then the following, either at harvest, after harvest, or the following spring, we put bait traps in that center row. And then that tells us whether tuber blemish protection is equal to wireworm mortality. So let's look at uh, blemish protection. This is harvest one at 100, and, uh, a 100 days after planting. This is uh, a uh, blemish protection as a percentage of the control, which is 100% damage. Um, we look at thymet, that's our standard. So we have to match or beat that. And we find that Titan, which is clothanidin as a seed treatment, uh, gives us very good control at a, at a high rate, at 12.5 uh, grams active per 100 kilograms of potato seed. It works well in British Columbia, <coughs> but the same treatment does not work well in Prince Edward Island. This is Taraxa, as good as 4 -8. And this is Titan plus Taraxa, which gives us very, very good control. Okay. Now the second harvest at 120 days after planting is shown here. So with 4.8 at 120 days, uh, this is the level of control relative to Titan, which is eh, maybe not as good. This is Taraxa. And uh, it's uh, not significantly different than uh, Thymet. And of course, the Titan Plus Taraxa gives us, once again, very, very good control. OK. Now let's look at where we're in survival. Now these are bait traps that are put in uh, the center row at the time of harvest. So the number of small wireworms shown here. Uh, there's no small wireworms in the Taraxa plots. Lots of small wireworms in the uh, Titan plots. So it doesn't seem to uh, control uh, the small wireworms. The resident wireworms are shown here. Not very many resident wireworms in the Taraxa treatments uh, relative to the untreated control. Uh, here in the, clotha, in, in the Titan treatment, you're starting to see um, a fair number of uh, resident wireworms surviving. If you look at all wireworms together, if you look at thymet as being the standard, we get an 88% drop in all wireworm counts. In Taraxa, 97%. In Titan plus Taraxa, 99%. In the Titan treatment, um, you know, it's about 50%. And uh, what we think is happening here is the wireworms are starting to come out of their deep sleep at that point, that's at harvest. Now look at this. This is how much, uh, how many grams active ingredient of, uh, of thymet are used in the soil as a granular treatment relative to Taraxa. 3,230 grams compared to 25 grams. Thymet, one part per million will kill a person. Taraxa, it's about, it, it takes about 5,000 grams. So you can see the difference in, in safety here. Silver bullet. Okay. So how does Taraxa measure up as a cereal and potato treatment to control wireworms? 
We want something that kills all pest wireworm species in all wireworm developmental stages. We have that with Teraxin. We want something that protects cereals and potatoes from damage. We've got that. It's as good as anything else out there. We want something that doesn't have phytotoxicity. Never seen it in our cereal or potato trials. Uh, something uh, we need something that um, uh, we can use very at very small amounts per hectare. We definitely have that with Teraxa, say relative to Thymac. Uh, we want something that does not have residue concerns. At that low amount with Teraxa in cereals and in potatoes, we're not going to have that. Also, uh, we want something that's not highly toxic to vertebrates. Definitely Teraxa applies there. Will not endanger non-target species, <coughs> such as bees. We've got that. Uh, it stays in the ground. It's not systemic. It's not brought to the surface. Uh, we need something that is cost-effective and practical for growers. Uh, we expect that to be the case. And it definitely qualifies as the new silver bullet. So about Teraxa or broflanolide is the first insecticide in the new class of insecticides known as metadiamides. It's registered on cereals uh, and potatoes in Canada. It's now registered on cereals in the US as of uh, last month. Now, broflanolide or Teraxa is not systemic. That means it's not taken up by the plant as it is with um, some other insecticides. But the advantages are that it will stay in the ground. It uh, doesn't move very far from where you put it, which is an environmental plus. And in potatoes, for example, you're putting it about six inches underground. The disadvantages are that uh, the tracks will not control above ground pests. It's not taken up into the plant as with say the neonix, diamides, and fipronil, which will uh, also control, say, Colorado potato beetle. But if you need to uh, control both above ground and wireworms, then you can uh, combine Teraxa with a neonic treatment. And it, the uh, neonics do not seem to interfere with the effectiveness of Teraxa. So this is a, a trial where we had Teraxa at five grams, uh, cruiser at 30 grams, we get uh, very good uh, cereal crop protection. If you combine Teraxa with cruiser, uh, it doesn't affect the efficacy at all. And the following year, when, uh, or if you look at mortality, looking at um, Teraxa, we get 92% kill at five grams. Uh, we don't get much kill with cruiser. And um, if you combine cruiser with Teraxa, you get about a 90% kill. So uh, combining them doesn't seem to affect efficacy. Thank you very much. And I'd like to thank uh, all of these people uh, very quickly. And uh, uh, you can read, hopefully you can read fast. Uh, I'd like to especially thank BASF um, for all of their help over the years. And I'm going to pass things over to Ann now. Helped if I'm not on mute. Hi, everyone. Um, hopefully, everyone can see my screen now. And that uh, thanks very much to Dr. Vernon for presenting uh, his research. That was really great to hear and a great introduction into Cymegra. Uh, my name is Anne McRae. I work as a technical service specialist for BASF. Um, I've worked for BASF uh, for almost 12 years now, and I've been sort of on the horticulture side as a technical specialist for three years. So I'm going to focus on um, potatoes specifically, and uh, there'll be a little bit of a review of what Bob talked about, and then some details on how you can use this product and some of the frequently asked questions we get and things like that. Okay. 
So let's get started. So Cymegra. Cymegra is, as uh, was mentioned by Dr. Vernon, is the active ingredient is proflanolide, and uh, it is the in furrow treatment for wireworms for potatoes. It provides that confidence to control your wireworm pop populations, giving you some peace of mind knowing you know, your yield and quality is protected. It's a powerful top performer, as we've seen in the work that Dr. Vernon has done, uh, delivering wireworm mortality, not just intoxicating, and Cymegra is an excellent resistant, resistant management tool, which I'll get into a little bit. Um, with this new mode of action, group 30, which is proflanolide. So, as I mentioned, we'll talk a little, I want to uh, go into a little bit of detail about this new mode of action. So, you've seen lots of trial work and field work. Um, I'll do a little bit of explanation on why uh, proflanolide is working so well to kill those wireworms. It is the first compound in this newly designated IRAC group, group 30. Uh, it's a powerful new mode of action, excellent control of wireworms, as we've seen. What it does is it binds to a specific site of action uh, upon contact um, that impacts the wireworm's central nervous system. So it causes this rapid, irreversible, hyperactivity of nerve and muscle cells. So similar to a lot of the insecticides on the market, like Neonix, it attacks that the nervous system. But it's a little different because it is a group 30. Um, it, it works on the GABA-gated chloride channel allosteric modulators. So what that means is Basically, in the nervous system, so if you look at this square on the top left-hand side, there are two types of signals through the nervous system. Um, the excitatory signals here and inhibitory signals. Excitatory signals are needed for action, and inhibitory signals counteract that excitation. So the balance is crucial for normal insect behavior normal movements, they need to be able to send signals to the brain for stop-go action. So the neurotransmitters such as GABA, as we mentioned that this is GABA-gated, um, communicate these signals between cells. In a normally functioning nervous system, GABA released by one cell activates GABA receptors of another cell resulting in inhi inhibition, which is what is going on here. This is what is normally happening and these are the GABA channels. So what Cymegra does, or what the active ingredient proflanolate does, is it prevents GABA from transmitting these inhibitory signals. So in these top ones, Cymegra inserts itself in here and prevents these uh, inhibitory signals, which causes overexcitation of the nervous system and leads to incapacitation of the insect. And so, as Dr. Vernon mentioned, this leads to mortality, which we've seen uh, in studies already. Uh, this kind of just showing in this orange line is Cymegra, where slowly over time we receive up to 90 to 95% mortality versus your traditional like neonic treatment where you're just sort of putting them to sleep or intoxicating them. So let's talk a little bit about act the actual use of Cymegra and sort of our best management practices. It is an in furrow treatment, so the application rate is 250 milliliters per hectare, uh, which also equates to about 2.3 milliliters of Cymegra per 100 meters of row, this being at the 36 inch row spacing. Uh, if your row spacing is not that size, there is a calculator in the label. So you just refer to the label and you can calculate out uh, your exact rate. This is applied as an in furrow spray, commonly covering, spraying both the ground and covering your seed piece. You want to make sure you're using enough water so you're uh, thoroughly covering that seed piece and the ground around it to protect it. So in this case, 
we would recommend a minimum of 50 liters of water per hectare uh, to achieve that full coverage. And this is um, only registered as an infro application, so you do not apply Cymegra as on, over top of a hill or on a soil surface. Um, it will not be effective. Some of, we often, this being a new product, get a number of questions uh, around how it works and storage and things like that. So I've put together some sort of frequently asked questions. Uh, this is, uh, so first of all, it's not systemic, which I think was touched on, but um, just to reiterate that, that means it does not move through the plant. It will stay in the soil. It is protecting those below ground, from below ground pests it's protecting from wireworms, but will not have any activity on above ground pests. That's where your Titan treatment comes in. So a tag mix in furrow with Cymegra and Titan works really well to protect from wireworms and your uh, above ground pests such as Colorado potato beetle. For storage, uh, we'll recommend that you prevent from freezing. Um, however, in those instances where it does freeze, we found that if you bring it back up to temperature and agitate it really well, um, it will still work. Cymegra so is a liquid formulation, so very easy to use. It's an SC. So we recommend that you do follow just proper tank mix guidelines uh, when doing that tank mix. And along with that, I've created a list of tank mix compatibility tests that we have done. Uh, to make sure um, everything's okay going into the tank. So any of the insecticide, your commonly used insecticides and fungicides, we have tested and confirmed that they are tank mix compatible. Um, what we have found is that you do not tank mix Cymegra with in furrow fertilizers or liquid fertilizers. So any of those liquid NPK fertilizers that you're using in furrow cause um, a reaction so that you create a lot of sediment if Cymegra is mixed with it. So we recommend to stay away from those, but any of your, um, any of these the things on this list, traditional insecticides, fungicides, et cetera, are all okay to take mix with. Uh, and, of course, with a new product, we always get questions around MRLs. So I just wanted to touch on, uh, we do have MRLs established for North America. Uh, this is because the US has now received registration. We also have registration here in Canada. So everything in North America is, is good to go. Other key markets, as most of you are probably aware, take time to establish MRLs in. So it will take uh, subsequent, in sub subsequent years, we are expecting to have those MRLs, but they have not been established for this year. So we, BASF has been proactively engaging with some of the major potato processors out there, so they are aware of Cymegra and what it offers. We recommend, if you would like to use it, that you first talk to your potato contractor, uh, just to make sure that they support your use uh, because we have we don't there are not emeralds established in all countries. So in conclusion, Cymegra sets the new standard for wireworm control in potatoes, and we hope that uh, anyone who really needs this product will get a chance to use it this year. It is fast fast acting, has thorough uh, thorough uh, coverage over your seed piece. Uh, through contact and ingestion. It breaks the life cycle of wireworms and helps reduce resident populations. Cymegra, so with its new novel mode of action, broflanolide, which is a group 30, is registered for infra use on potatoes and also in corn. Um, I hope you're able to add Cymegra into your wireworm management program this upcoming season and feel free to reach out to me at any time with any questions. And speaking of questions, I will turn it back so we can sort of open everything up. Thanks. Perfect. Thank you both very much for the informative presentations. We'll jump into a few questions here that came in. 
Um, Bob, when going from a grass field into potatoes, will plowing the field green in the spring have an effect on how well an inforo insecticide like thymet or semegra will work? Sorry, Bob, you're, you're muted there. Okay, can you can you hear me now? Can you see me? Okay. Yes, we can. All right. Um, yeah. If if um, what what we found uh, in in our research and uh, other people have uh, validated this is uh, if you try and go from a say green field or a grassy field or field of pasture or whatever uh, into potatoes. If you plow that under in the spring, for example, if you plowed under green, uh, what happens is that you're also plowing under all of the uh, wireworm uh, populations that are feeding on the uh, green uh, manure. And so what happens is that if you plow your field green, uh, the wireworms will be about, you know, six inches to 12 inches under underground. And they'll continue to feed on that green manure um, while you plant your, say, potato crop. So you put your potato crop in on top of that green manure. And um, uh, with your insecticides, um, at the time of planting, you want all of the wireworms in that field to go to your planted row. And uh, it, in doing so, they will contact the insecticide, which is at its higher or at its highest level at, at that point. So uh, if if they don't, if they're tied up in the green manure, then they will not go to your treated rows uh, until the end of the summer when all of that green manure is rotted away. Then you've got all of those untouched and still living wireworms leaving the rotted away green manure and going to your daughter uh, tubers. And that is a situation when we find that uh, chemicals like thymet don't work. Uh, the same thing would occur with uh, semegra. So keep that in mind that if you are going to um, go from a uh, field of grass into potatoes, you got to get rid of that uh, field of grass, top kill it or whatever the year before or the fall before. Okay, and then you can plow it on here. Okay, perfect. Kind of a follow-up question here. Um, would the use of cover crops over winter proliferate the wireworm population? Um, okay, if you if you have a, a cover crop which uh, goes in in the in late summer or fall, is that what you're referring to? Yeah, and the, you, okay. you can. Wrong, but he, yeah, they just ask, does the use of cover crops over winter proliferate it? Uh, you're not going to have any eggs laid in that over winter crop. Um, but depending on how you get rid of that um, over winter cover crop, uh, once again, if you're going to go into potatoes, you don't want to plow it under uh, green. Okay, perfect. Great. Thank you. Um, and a question for you, so does semigra control all wireworm species? Can you confirm that? So semigra will have, a, so we've tested it across the country in many different provinces and have gotten similar levels of control as you're seeing uh, with Bob's trials. Um, we'll have around, I think, nine species on the label, so it covers all of the major ones, yes. And if I could add something to that, uh, because uh, Taraxa or Semegra uh, is very, very close to Fipronil, uh, we've done a lot of work with different species uh, with Fipronil, and it seems to work um, on uh, all of the species very, very well that, that we work with. And I expect uh, the results we had with Fipronil will also be, uh, we can carry that over to uh, Taraxa as well. Uh, once they contact it and it gets in their system, they get that red symptom and they are dead. Um, and we haven't found any, any species uh, where that uh, doesn't happen. Okay, great. 
great, thank you. Um, and one of you comment on the risk of resistance of using Traxa in the cereal crop followed by Semegra and potatoes? Uh, because wildworms have such a long life history, uh, it's highly unlikely that they are going to develop resistance. And um, um, farmers used uh, uh, organochlorines, uh, which kind of operate very similarly to Taroxa, uh, but the old fashioned organochlorines that were used for decades from the 50s, 60s, and 70s, uh, we never had any ins uh, instances of uh, resistance happening with. Um, the organochlorines on wireworms. Uh, there's only been a few cases of wireworms developing resistance globally. Uh, so in terms of them developing resistance, I don't think that's that's a concern at all. Um, and any crop rotation issues? Uh, no, so we have, there's a 30 day uh, plant back, which they usually say, so if it was applied in the soil and then for some reason you weren't using, um, didn't get your crop in, you have to wait 30 days, but that's pretty unlikely with the way this is applied. Um, so, and then after the 30 days, it's fine. Any, any crop can be planted. So anything the year after is absolutely fine. Take a few more questions coming in here. Can you touch on um, all in furrow fertilizer not being recommended? Your comments on that? Yep. Yeah, so um, we've done some compatibility testing uh, with various what we like liquid fertilizers anything with that has like a nitrogen phosphorus potassium liquid fertilizer that growers would traditionally use as a carrier would be applying in fur in furrow so we've uh mixed with it with cymegra when you're using a fertilizer as a carrier and we've also added it uh the fertilizer into water with cymegra and in both cases we found it created a heavy sediment that can uh, it kind of binds up the cymegra. So for one, because it's kind of binding it up and creating a sediment, it probably won't work as well as it should, but also it can clog things up. So we were just recommending um, not to uh, not to use those or to do the most important thing is run do a jar test of your own to make sure it's okay. You will it won't take long. You just have to mix the two products in a jar and you'll see it bind up right away. So that's the best way to know for sure is to do your own drug test. Um, okay, a bit of a case question here. Uh, there's some growers in Quebec who rotates potatoes and soybeans, and they have issues with wireworms. Any comments or insights for that? They were thinking that the grass plants were more of the problem, um, but they're still seeing the wireworm issues. Yeah, um, so probably what you're saying or the uh, people in uh, Quebec are saying is is that uh, there's egg laying going on in uh, uh, soybean. Is, um, was it the soybean you were referring to? Yes, yeah, yeah, rotation between potatoes and soybeans. Yeah. Yeah. Um, okay. Well, if if there's if there's wireworm buildup happening, um, then there's probably some egg laying going on in soybean crops. Uh, we find that they will lay eggs in potatoes, and the species that we have here. Uh, it's species specific. Um, uh, different species have different preferences for where they will lay eggs. Uh, most species will lay eggs in grasses and cereal crops. Uh, other species uh, might lay uh, more eggs in uh, uh, potatoes than other species. You know, it's uh, going to vary from species to, to species. In the, in the case of a uh, soybean uh, potato, 
uh, location uh, with semegra. Uh, semegra in used in potatoes will probably take out most of the wildworm populations and uh, protect the potatoes as well as give you a bit of a kickback to the following year when you go into soybeans. So, um, you know, even though it's, it's not registered on, on soybeans, you've uh, probably taken out a lot of the neonates and residents uh, in the field during the potato year. And it all depends on uh, what the rotation looks like. It's uh, one or two years of uh, soybean uh, and then potatoes, or is it uh, just one year soybean, one year potatoes, whatever. If it's uh, one year soybean, one year potatoes, then you'll probably get uh, good wireworm control in your soybeans by treating them in the potatoes with uh, some Okay, great, thanks. Um, and this might be a question for you. Um, can you comment on the availability of Terexa in Eastern Canada? Um, it's available in 2021, but do you see that moving forward? Yes, great question. So uh, as you mentioned, we have Terexa F4 is available in the, uh, in the West, um, but not currently in the East, but we are definitely running um, further testing with that and looking into that. So stay tuned for more information on that in the future. Great. Um, and one other here, we got a, a question about corn. Um, in corn, will it control seed corn maggot or various cutworm species? So um, we are continuing to do trial work with uh, broflanolide, Cymegra and Terexa. Um, and it has shown some activity with different uh, maggot species as well. So we're still looking into that. Well, I'm going to end it there. Um, that's covered most of our questions. We've wrapped up about 60 minutes after we started. Um, if you have any further questions, following the presentation, please reach out to us and we can connect you with the speakers. And before we end today, one last special thank you to our sponsor, BASF, and to our speakers, Dr. Robert Vernon and Anne McRae. As a reminder, uh, this webinar has been approved for one CCA CEU credit. If you did not submit your certification number when registering, please email your first and last name and CCA number to webinars at annexbusinessmedia.com. These instructions will also be found in our follow-up Email, which will record or hold the recording of the webinar. So again, thank you very much for tuning in to today's webinar and don't forget to visit potatoesincanada.com slash webinars to register for the next free webinar series in early March. Stay well, stay warm, and take care.